Uh, similarly, there is work on the question of um, how uh, uh, in an area uh, of protein design, the, the question is how rare or common are folded protein structures within the space of all the possible ways that there are of arranging amino acids. It's a quantitative question. And some of this work suggests that there are certain kinds of, there's a certain number of mutations that can occur and maintain a basic uh, protein fold, but that multi mu multiple mutations at, at uh, different sites end up effacing the structure of that protein before others come online. And that gives a sense of, again, what mutation can do and what it may not be able to do, placing some limits on mutation as, a, as an engine of biological change. So, and that's a quantitative aspect of our research program. Peter, let's put the question to you. Is there a quantitative or mathematical means of expressing a reducible complexity? Not that I know of. Um, we're certainly, if you look at the Behe arguments, uh, they're very strange. Joe Felsenstein, again, a, a theoretical geneticist in the back, has already come up with some very interesting mathematics that show that the Behe arguments just don't hold water at all. They, they require an assumption that's totally not the way the world works. They're saying that every mutation is always lethal. We know this isn't the case. And we know it isn't simply uh, we, just... We, we never claim that every mutation is always well, lethal. Go back and look at your own literature. No, 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 no. Look at Behe's response to this paper in Science two weeks ago. Okay. I mean, clearly, there are two mutations there, but they did not produce an irreducibly complex system. So, next question. Okay. Uh, for you, your former UW colleague, Dr. Guillermo Gonzalez, has proposed intelligent design and cosmology, the origins of the universe, and his book's been praised by the Royal Academy of Astronomy and others. Um, yes. He has peer-reviewed. Uh, do you admit that his work on intelligent design is real science? Uh, Guillermo Gonzalez does some really good real science. What he studies is the metallicity in stars. And he's looking at what stars would have planets, what don't. That work is first rate. His work on galaxies is first rate. His book's a bunch of trash. It's just crap. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you want to his, why? His book, also, his, his book also results in a number of predictions. And uh, since you've challenged me on this so many times, we'll put up tomorrow on our website some predictions that intelligent design makes. Okay. Well, let me go back to Guillermo's book. Guillermo's book is called Perfect Planet. And privileged. Oh, privileged planet. I thought it was perfect planet. So privileged planet. Uh, Guillermo's ultimate, utmost understanding is that we are the unique life form on the universe. And he, all the arguments, taking that given assumption, then all arguments he does tries to prove that. So that's where that comes from. Okay. Uh, Steve, question for you. Um, does the intelligent designer update and modify his work? Ooh, that's a good one. Does, sorry. Does the, does the intelligent designer update and well, modify his work? Evolution takes place, so that's yeah, so I, I think, one I shot. Think, yeah, the, no, I think there may be, uh, there, I think there are different loci of design in the universe that, along the timeline, and that there may be instances of design. Uh, we see them when we see large infusions of new information. So I think the Cambrian explosion is likely an event that owes its origin to design. I think that the fine-tuning of the laws of physics and chemistry, the beginning of the universe, are... Uh, are evidence of design. I think the information that you need to build the first life is evidence of design. So those are at least three events that involve the designer updating his work. But well, if we were going to give you any telescope in the world, how could you go to that first one, the origin of the universe? Could you come up with a series of astronomical tests that would tell you that it was designed and not by natural forces? Um, could you come up with a series of astronomical tests that would tell you that the many universe hypothesis, which has been proposed as an alternative to intelligent design, uh, no, both of those are theories are, at the cosmological level are, are theories which are, are contending to explain phenomena about which we already know. Uh-oh. There's the man. Oh, so stop we're, stop we're, this. Uh, we're yeah. running out of time. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Last, last question. Last question. Oh. Well, I'm going to change it a little bit then since that's the last one. Let, let, uh, the, somebody in the audience, Stephen, wanted to ask you the question, are you a Christian? And we talked a little bit about this before, and, and I thought it was an interesting discussion, so I'll put it to both of you. Do you think, one, that your own religious beliefs have any role in our discussion here tonight? First, do you? Um, I am a Christian. I think my religious beliefs have made me more open to explanatory possibilities in science that I, uh, than I would be if I were strict materialist. Because if you're strict, if you're strict materialist, if you're strict materialist, you can't consider that an intelligent cause played a role in any event um, in, prior to the advent of humans. So, 
uh, I think that it, it has engendered some methodological openness, uh, the, the fact that I have a theistic perspective. Um, the one thing I would like to say about this that is, I think many do, people do get confused in understanding the, this debate. I think that on both sides you have competing explanations of evidence. Uh, I think you have competing scientific theories of, of evidence, but both theories, a, a purely undirected evolutionary theory and an ideas of intelligent design have larger, uh, larger metaphysical implications. And where, where Peter's been somewhat um, uh, you know, taciturn about that, many of the, the leading spokesmen in the, in the Darwinian camp, Richard Dawkins, for example, was here a year or so ago. His famous quote is that Darwinism made it, uh, uh, made it possible to become an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Uh, one of the things that we want to say is that, that you have to evaluate arguments and evidence uh, straight up. You, it would be completely illicit for me to critique Dawkins by saying, to critique his scientific arguments by saying, well, you're an atheist and you have atheistic motives. We just want to be accorded the same respect and to have the arguments and the evidence and the experimental work that we do accorded, uh, uh, evaluated on the basis of that, not with motive mongering. You know what? Okay. And Peter, you get, you get the last word, but, but it, can you try to answer our question uh, in, in, in your concluding remarks? Can you try to answer that question about your own religious beliefs and does it have a role in our discussion? Well, I just want to say that some of the greatest of all evolutionists, Fisher, Haldane, Dobzhansky, were devout Christians. There is ab there hey, was, hey, 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 hold on. There is absolutely, because religion and science are so separate, I mean, there is absolutely no conflict. Dawkins is totally... Hey, could you just let him... Hey, is that polite? so good all What's night. wrong with you, Yahoos? Now, huh? This is a polite discourse. Only he and I yell at each other. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to let you finish. <laughs> Again, Dawkins, I think, has done a huge disservice by saying that you're stupid if you're religious. I mean, this is idiotic on his part. There is no reason that a devout scientist cannot be a devout religious believer. The two are different hemispheres. If you study if you study science, in fact, it makes you more wondrous. Just having the ability to test, just having the ability to understand nature, I think, gives you a tr profound sense of religious awe. As for me, this week, I'm a druid. <laughs> okay. And with that, we're going to... We're, we're uh, up until the last three words, we found a, a, a good place to end with in agreement. That's Thank right, you, Peter. Yes, Thank sir. you both. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.